cheers to episode 65. Oh, so close. Cheers, episode 65. Cheers. Can't wait for a month, dude. Four weeks from now. That's what you're saying, Evan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. 69, Grant. That's what Evan. <laughs> oh. That would be probably be our, uh, that would be our draft, either our draft podcast or the live show draft. Yeah. We'll probably just do a snake draft of the women we find most attractive. Oh! Oh, Whoa. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm drinking black coffee. I don't have anything. Seven o'clock. I'm drinking water. No, Alex, you have a new hat. Yeah. Go Deacons. Go Deacons. Congratulations, Emily. Congratulations, Congratulations Emily. Emily. Law school. To a prestigious university. The Kenneth Walker School. Tim Chris Duncan Paul. School. The Tim, Tim Duncan School. Duncan. Christopher the, Ball. The quarterback from QB high one. school. Yeah, beyond, QB1 Beyond the Lights. Sam Hartman. It's called. Yes. Great Paul. All right. Well, welcome on in to the number one sports podcast in the state of Michigan. Today is... Monday, March 28th, 7.07 p.m. Got some women's Elite Eight basketball cooking tonight on the TV in front of me. And vacation is over. Vacation For now. Over. Unfortunately, vacation's over. But my yeah. body thanks me that vacation is over. Yeah, I, don't know I, th- I think I my body was ready to take a break. I bet you I could do one more day down there. One more full day like we did. I could have done a couple half days here and there or gone somewhere else, a little mellow. Um, But my feet were barking after that last day. Those shoes have no support in them. Oh, really? You had a little little foot foot blister going on. I don't have any blisters. It just felt like I I was walking barefoot on concrete for 90 hours. My legs were feeling it today, for sure. So, to preview the show little teaser there is we'll have our weekly recaps which is basically just our trip to nashville that we took vacations over and then we have college basketball which is our sweet 16 elite eight recap observations storylines maybe a little final four picks i I think we should do who's going to win this whole thing then we'll have a michigan villanova recap of that game mixed into the sweet 16 and then we have kind of kind of brief because we don't want to preview too much before you know, like we've always said on the show, we're more of a reaction podcast and like a preview and podcast. So we're going to do a brief recaps of our team seasons basketball wise. And then just a little preview of what we maybe like them to do in the portal or our next year, any changes. And then we have some life questions uh, at the end of the show. We have a life question at the start of the show and we have one some at the end of the show time permitting, but we should be able to get to them, I would say. Um, so. Before we get into our Nashville recap, this isn't necessarily a segment, but it's just kind of a quick quick hitters I'd like to just us to get our thoughts on um, before we get into our recap. So today was a huge day for the Detroit Lions, first and foremost, and pretty, pretty uh, fresh news today. So we started off with the Adam Schefter tweet that the Lions will be the selection for hard knocks. What were your guys' reactions when that came true? Very excited. And jazzed. Because I like Hard Knocks a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't say I was... Sh- I wasn't that shocked. Um, I'm happy it was announced. But I wasn't that shocked because we were like one of the final five or three teams that couldn't say no if we were offered it. Um, and then with a new head coach, he's kind of an outgoing personality, different personality. Um, it was only a matter of time before we got it. So, but I can't wait to watch it because now... The entire country is going to be watching the same thing as us. And so we're going to actually get a taste of what actually Detroit is all about. Yeah. And I I do think that's a good point that I didn't think of right away is that we probably don't get it if it's not for Dan Campbell. I think his his viral clips going back to just his opening press comments are a huge reason why they decided to choose us. Because it always feels like our stereotype of Detroit is that the national media just wants to ignore us as much as possible. But I think they're becoming a little bit harder to ignore because a lot of also gamblers loved the Lions last year with our record against the spread. So there was a lot of positive momentum with the Lions culture. My initial thought was 
I felt bad for Jared Goff because I remember when he went on part in my take one of his first times. So Hard Knocks came for his first year in LA with Jeff Fisher and Jared talked about how much he hated it. And he also credited it to some of their struggles in LA. So it makes me a little bit nervous as a fan of what our on-field performance could look like because from what he described it is a massive distraction and it just really is a nuisance to a lot of people during training camp. So that would be the negative side of us getting hard knocks. This is Jared Goff's third time on hard knocks. He's third. gonna be sick of it. Third, Dude. third, right, because, because they, they did the, the Rams Chargers like half and half. That's right, that's and right. They like went to his house and stuff, and he was all he over hates it. it. I feel bad for him for that. Third time for Jerry. Well, he's the fifth highest cap hit in the NFL this year, so he deserves to suck it up a little bit for whatever the six weeks that it's on. <laughs> the pro- the price of uh, your contract. Okay, I can get behind that. Um, but like, it just media fan guy of a team. I'm gonna love it because it's basically the inside the den that we already talk about on this show, but on steroids because you get the all Lord. the cussing, you get all the cussing, you get better production value. Um, they show you things that like a, a team like the Lions on inside the den. They're not gonna sh- try to show you drama. Or, like, if there's any fights. But, like, HBO doesn't care. They want that. So, that'll be fun. Um, is there any, like, big storylines that you immediately thought of that you're curious to see develop over this uh, this drama? Yeah. Whoever our rookie quarterback is. And they just do a spotlight on how they're going to take over the Oh, job. wow. Rookie quarterback battle. It seems to happen in hard knocks, like, every year. So, if we were to draft a quarterback, that would be probably a big storyline. Um, I think Amonra is going to be a star of the show. Um, he was kicking footballs and getting into little tussles and fights last year at training camp, and there was no eyeballs on him. So um, now he broke out as a star, so I think the cameras are going to be all over him 24-7 at, on Hard Knocks. Oh, yeah. They're probably going to do a lot of Jeff Okuda rehab. Oh, it's a big storyline. The, the comeback, America loves comeback stories. Is... Is uh Jamal Williams still on our team? Yes. Yeah. Oh, he'll be massive. He'll it'll there might be a whole episode devoted to that guy. There's gonna be a Hawkinson thing for sure. They'll probably talk about him, have his own little go to big, his house, see how he lives. Big Ben Johnson, new O C role. That'll be big. We'll get to see more about him. Well, Maybe some Ken Dorsey. Of him. I want to see where Dan Campbell is. I want to go to work one day with Dan Campbell. I want like him to ride in his big old truck to work at like 4 a.m. That's that's how I want the series to start. <laughs> They're going to show him drinking like 12 cups of coffee, guaranteed. Oh, there'll be a coffee bit. Yeah. Probably like, there'll be a shot of his desk with just a bunch of empty venti Starbucks cups. And then it'll like cut to like how much coffee he drinks. I think it'd be They'll better. Be... I think this would be better than the Cowboys. I know the Cowboys are a bigger brand, but like Jerry definitely dominates that series and is all over it, like nonstop. And I, where I don't think Sheila or Brad Holmes or Rod Wood would take that much media away from like seeing authentic uh, Dan Campbell. Yes, you know who's gonna. Uh, maybe not. Maybe he's more calm, but I feel like Dorsey's gonna get his foot in this series just because he yes. loved the limelight there when he was with the Cleveland. He's Another be all guy over that's this. already been all over Hard Knocks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it should be really fun. And then the other news is that we got the draft, which is exciting for the city. Me personally, I don't know. It was just kind of like, oh, that's cool. Like, I don't, I didn't get, I was more excited about the Hard Knocks news today than I was about the draft news. The draft news was more surprising to me, though. I did not think that we would get a draft. Yeah, well, I did see that we're never going to get a Super Bowl again. So that's probably why they gave <laughs> us the draft. Okay. All right. Well, it's understandable we're not why we're not going to get a Super Bowl. We're unlikely to ever build a new stadium in the near 25 years. And, and give the Super Bowl new- we had wasn't – we didn't do a great job, according to reports. Well, that was so was 2000, what, 2006, five, seven, five, yeah, four, six or seven. I believe we would do a better job now. Um, but, yeah, I think it's going to be good for the city of Detroit. Um, I don't know if we're going to bring as many – fans as Nashville did because I saw a tweet here. He said Nashville brought in over 600,000 uh, fans and generated 225 million for local businesses and like the community. Jeez. I'm, I'm guessing it would be like half the amount of fans just because I mean, Nashville's a destination city all by itself. Um, I'm guessing probably around 300, 350,000 fans Midwest. Um, I just hope the weather's good. 
I hope it's better than Cleveland's. Wasn't didn't they have it last year? Yeah. Yeah, Cleveland's was eh. But it was also <laughs> pandemic. It was also COVID hard. restrictions to that. And bad weather, wasn't it? Like really yeah, windy one day. Cold and rainy. It rained did in I Nashville see, too. Did I see that if our weather is bad, they're gonna put it indoors? Yes, yeah. weather permitting. Interesting. Probably like LCA. Did that Las Vegas one get canceled? Do they not do that? It's going back to Las Vegas next, next year. year. Where is it they, this year? That, they had that sweet layout is it of uh, them like going on a boat for each yeah. draft pick to like the Bellagio fountain. And that was like supposed that. to be the 2020 <laughs> draft, but now they had to cancel that because of COVID. So they moved the draft. Uh, it's in Las Vegas this year. Good. We do not want to follow that draft. <laughs> no. We Where follow... is it at in 2023? It is in Kansas City. Okay, oh, that's fine. Okay, we can do that. As long as it's not either yep. in LA, that's fine. Yeah, we just don't want to like, be like, oh, we don't want national reporters being like, man, I really wish like we weren't in Detroit this year. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So, two big news, news day for Detroit. Shout out to us. Getting our, say our name. And then <laughs> non-sports... Non sports, one of the craziest clips and moments I've seen in my my young life. Will Smith slapped the shit quote of Chris Rock last night at the Oscars, and people. Well, there's there was two questions we got. They're basically the same thing, but they're two. One just said thoughts on the slap heard around the world, and two was did Chris Rock deserve to get slapped? So we can kind of use those as our jumping off point. But my uh, thoughts is okay. Yeah, go back. No, no, you go. Good. Oh, no, mine's no. You go. You go. All right. Controversial grant. I still am in the camp that I think it's fake. I haven't been convinced it was real. I think it could be fake. I also don't know. I didn't hear the joke, Chris Rock's joke. So I don't know if he deserved it. I just saw so, the slap and the cursing. I'll try to tell you what happened unbiasedly then for some people. Because, like, people, you know, like my mom this morning, it was kind of funny. She's like, what was said? Because she's not all over Twitter. So if you. If you didn't get on Twitter, you didn't know the raw version of all like the words that were said because it was funny. In America, we're on tape delay; they bleep that stuff out. Which in America, you didn't you didn't see that live. You had to go to Twitter. But in Australia, turns out in other countries, they just play the raw audio, and that's where all those clips from Twitter were coming from, where you actually hear the cussing involved. But anyways, do you guys know the backstory of Will Smith's wife and him, and how they have a weird relationship? Correct. Yes. She cheated on him or something. She cheated on him with this like 23 year old rapper dude named August something. And then I think it like came out that they have an open relationship. So I believe they're still together, but they're just allowed to kind of do what they want. And I believe from what I was reading that her name's Jada. She recently was going through um, or got diagnosed with alopecia where she's losing her hair. So right now she has that kind of remember like, uh, was it Wiz Khalifa's wife who had that kind of shaved head look that's what jada smith has right now and this is before before my time but there was a movie probably like earlier in our lives with demi moore called gi jane where demi moore got like a buzz cut and was like gi joe but gi jane so chris rock was talking like oh about best actor about will smith and was like hey jada can't wait to see you in gi jane too like referencing that she has like no hair right now and you, you see the clip and like Will Smith starts laughing at it and you can t- immediately tell that his wife hates it. Jada hates it. And so it kind of looks like Will was just trying to laugh it off and then he looked at his wife who turns out she's very upset about that and then he got up and just smacked them. And then um, yelled some profanities. Oh, some loud, well-pronounced it's, profanities. It was weird that everybody around it didn't like look uncomfortable. Like they all just kind of sat there like, that's why oh, I think I th- it could still be fake. I thought there was some nervous ass laughter in that theater. I think it was. I very thought it was weird announced. that people were laughing because they probably thought it was a bit. Was it? I. That's the thing. I don't know. Evan, do you think it was a bit? I don't think it was. I think it was one hundred percent real. I think Will Smith had enough of the jokes up there, and he took it <laughs> into his own hands or the face of Chris Rock. Also, the way Chris Rock reacted after Will Smith was yelling, you could tell he felt like awkward. So then yeah. I thought maybe it was definitely probably real, but then you never know because the Oscars ratings are garbage. The conspiracy theories are out. They did this for ratings. Theories behind everything. But as I, my whole point is, if it was a bit, then like the Oscars would and the camera crew and all of them would know 
it's a bit, and I don't think they would cut the feed in America. Did they cut it like live? They did cut, they they cut the they, audio where you couldn't hear anything. They cut it was the just audio. Silent. That they had to do that because of the f word. Yeah, but if it was a bit, I don't think Will Smith would have been dropping the f bombs because he's in on the bit. Maybe. I'm gonna go seventy percent real, thirty percent bit. I'm ninety nine percent real. And then as far as the whole, I'm I'm pretty on fake. I think I would need like to talk to one of them at a party, which would never happen, and like ask them, "Hey, was that real or fake?" And have one of them tell me, "No, that was a hundred percent real." Grant for me to be like, "Okay, I I trust you." But the thing is, is when it comes to deserve to get slapped, I feel like in a normal setting, you could be like, "Yeah, he did." But also, these guys are kind of like what Evan said with the price of Jared Goff's contract having to deal with hard knocks. When you're this famous, you just have to deal with these jokes. And Will Smith has been getting a lot of jokes because people have been making fun about him and his wife's open marriage and him being cheated on openly for a while now. So it probably was festering. But like people in Hollywood do these roast battles and they go get roasted for like clicks and stuff. I don't know. I just feel like. You can't just like walk on stage and smack a dude for a joke like that. You can talk to him after maybe and like hunt him down at the after party and talk to him. But I don't know. It's weird with comedians. They get that. They get like, oh, I'm a comedian. I'm allowed to make jokes like that. He could. Yeah. Chris Rock could have said much worse. He could have made some like. I've, I've heard comedians jokes. say much worse at like shows. But yeah, I don't know. Will Smith got pissed. Wires crossed. Just walked up there super casually and bitch slapped him. I mean. <laughs> It was probably Dude. called for, but it was like also the like softest, most feminine slap form ever too. Like the way he like had it so perfect like this and then finished like it was almost like someone taught him on a movie set how to slap a human being. And that's what he <laughs> enacted. I mean, he is an actor. He's probably learned how to slap someone. Chris Rock took it pretty well, though. Oh, incredibly well. He didn't even rub his face. He didn't no. touch his face. No, that it probably hurt. Also, I'll just say it for us. It's such a tough resemblance. Like Will Smith and Juwan Howard look very identical. <laughs> and it was just such a bad timing. There was a lot <laughs> of Juwan Will Smith memes. They look like they could be twins too. It's just it's that's like one of those things it's the universe is just too perfect that that happened like oh, two weeks later. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. My other two my last two points about it that made me think that it could be fake was the, the stunning lack of security guards that did anything when Will Smith got up on the stage. Because <laughs> he t- he had to walk up the catwalk, and there was no one trying to save Chris Rock. And also, Chris Rock was, like, leaning in a little bit, like, when it happened. So maybe he thought he was going to whisper in his ear or something. I don't know. But it seemed like he wasn't trying to defend himself. And then the very last thing, it's absurd that the Oscars in – whatever that whoever runs the logistics of that show let will smith stay in the building like if you hit someone in a bar you are kicked out immediately you don't get to stay there and then and then will smith won the award for best actor and then he gets to go on stage and give a speech so that's where i was like okay if this was real and he actually hit that man on stage someone's like hey will you need to leave like you can't just sit there and then win one of our biggest awards of the night and then cry and talk about how you need to defend the ones you love like what Hey, in showbiz, they always say keep the camera rolling. I don't think they were going to stop anybody. I'm pretty sure anybody can walk up there on the Oscars and do whatever they want until <laughs> until out of hand because they're like, well, nobody's done it before. You've never seen also, it before. Also, like the guy who wins Best Actor, I mean, of course they're going to let him walk on the stage. They wouldn't think he was just going up there to slap him. <laughs> and he just, you know, he, he, he walks so casually when he, he's like strutting his way up there, slapped him, and just strutted his way back. No one said anything. Super the, weird. The only thing, and what made me think of just walking on stage, the only thing that rivals it, but this was still crazier, was when Kanye went up there and just said Taylor Swift should not have won this award. It should have been Beyonce. <laughs> and just ripped the mic out of her hand. So that's, I guess, yeah, you can just... <laughs> Nobody's going to stop a celebrity walking on stage. Yeah. No, they're award, just not going to do it. <laughs> award festivals are free for all. Celebrity? Dude. The celebrity securities are just as bad as uh, the second fiddle security. So I was just going to say, the guy that just walked on the stage at uh, second fiddle. <laughs> I just the can't security stop guy laughing. was just smoking cigs probably or something. I can't stop laughing at the image of Will Smith just walking, slapping him, and just walking straight back. And just sitting He's got down. got the rest of the show to watch. <laughs> oh, my God. That's all time. All Keep time. my wife's name out of your f- 
fucking mouth. <laughs> and then he goes, no, I will. I will not be saying it again. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get into nasty Nashville. Smashville. Trashville. Nash Vegas. Pu- Pukeville. <laughs> Pukeville. We've seen, we did watch a lot of that this weekend. Yeah, when I told my mom that uh, there was people puking on the side of the road in Nashville, she was disgusted. She's like, I didn't realize Nashville was like that. I was Nashville like, oh, yeah. is very rowdy. It's bar lane, and you have people that don't know how to control themselves. We're also going to throw up. Yeah. I think she thought it was going to be like a more like bougier. I was like, no, there's some shades of faster horses in Nashville. Like, it's not it's, all just like it's prim the and country proper. country fans. What do, you, what do you expect? <laughs> yeah. Um, my first thing I wrote down, my first bullet point was for this trip, good Airbnb. The boys, we secured a good Airbnb. Shout out to me for sending the link. Shout out to Ben for pulling the trigger and getting the Airbnb. It's always crucial to have a good home base on a trip like this. Did you just credit yourself even though you voted for a different one? I'm crediting myself for finding that place in general, putting it on the group's radar. But then voted for a different one. Correct. Okay. Just wondering. (laughs) I found it. You wouldn't even have the chance to vote without me. But I voted for it, so I'll take 2% credit. Credit credit to you. Um, And credit to Evan for not voting. (laughs) That way it stayed two to one. Credit for Evan for not even looking (laughs) until he got there to see what we had picked. I just saw the preview picture in the group chat, and I was like, well, we're getting one of these, so. All right. What's what's your guys' bullet points from Nashville? Let's let's, uh, do hot potato. The all day drinking fest of I, I'm proud of myself and I'm proud of 99 percent of the group for pacing themselves <laughs> so very well. I mean, you're down there and we're drinking for ten or so hours, ten or more hours, and nobody lost their cool. Nobody, you know, spent too much. We didn't have to carry anybody out of anywhere. We didn't have to drag anybody home. You know, we were all able to physically walk ourselves to the Uber and then up into our rooms. So it was very nice. I'm proud that we were able to day drink. I'm proud of myself for being able to get a buzz the entire time. Mm. And Evan, shout out you because usually hangovers destroy your weekend. <laughs> you didn't have any issues. I woke no up, issues. I woke up with the, one of the worst headaches of my life. It felt like somebody was just driving a knife, just like perfectly just cutting my head. And, you know, we, we got, we rallied coffee, a, I mean, solid breakfast, lunch or whatever, and just a bunch of water. Yeah, really shout out breakfast. you for telling us to drink water constantly. Really, <laughs> really solid breakfast on Friday morning before we started drinking. Really mm, mediocre yeah. breakfast Saturday when we needed it the most. <laughs> Saturday, <laughs> yeah, that was one of my points. Saturday's breakfast lunch excursion was not good. <laughs> if you're going to get breakfast good. in Nashville at a local spot, you should probably get there about like 9.30. Yeah. 10.30 at the latest. In. Yeah, don't Did go to we, 11. Did we loaf around a little too long on Saturday? <laughs> Absolutely. We loafed. Yes. Um, my another point is that I will have like you talk about mental images you burn. I can vividly remember and will remember my first when I got my first eyeballs on the street that is Broadway on Friday when we took our Uber down around like 3 p.m. We're about a minute away because you look at the Uber's GPS and it says you're a minute from drop off. And I go, what? Like we came on these like side streets. I'm like, where's this street? I thought there was supposed to be a bunch of people down here. And we came up, you know, at one of the intersections next to Dirk's Bentley Bar because you don't go down the street of Broadway. And you just see what turned out to be Honky Tonk Central with three like different layers and just people just bodies just hanging over balconies on each row. And I go, oh, my gosh, this place is a zoo. That's just the word I wrote down for that street, a zoo. Yeah. It's fantastic. We went to 10 different bars, um, five each day, um, some better than others. But live bands are superior to um, some trash DJs. I'm going to say that. Live bands are nice. Live bands are cool. Way better than uh, EDM at Harper's. I agree. Shout out Rooftops. Mm. I yeah. like a rooftop bar. Ch- chop Those rooftops nice. with breezes when it's cold outside, though. <laughs> Shout out rooftops with heaters. Yes. Shout out rooftops with heaters. Shout out me for wearing a sweatshirt, even though Grant told me to wear a t-shirt. Because it was cold. I, think you, I still think you could have gotten away with a t-shirt on uh, 
Saturday. Although we did eat it outside during the Arkansas Duke game, that would have been a battle. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was a battle in a sweatshirt. Um, other good point before I touch on any positive drawbacks to Nashville is Seven Nation Army. Great song and at Honky Tonk Central, vividly remember, felt like the floor was going to cave underneath our feet. That song just gets people going. Yeah, I thought we were going down. <laughs> I did. I really, I did. really, it did not feel safe in that moment. Yeah. So maybe if you listen to this on the second floor of Honky Tonk Central, whoever works there, maybe, you know, reinforce that, that would. Just maybe check because it was pretty bouncy. Felt like I was on trampoline. Um, with all that being said, I can see because our, our local host, Brad, he was like, you know, a lot of times I'm not like coming down here like all the time when I want to go out. I don't come down here every weekend. I don't be like, all right, we're going out tonight. We're going to Broadway. I can see why locals that live there don't go there routinely. It's it's definitely your tourist area. And as we experienced ourselves just in the two days we were there, the songs that the live bands play, live bands are still great, but it can get very repetitive and I think the moment we all realized it was we were leaving one bar with the song being played. We show up to the next bar. That a song is immediately being played in the next bar. And you're just like, there was a handful of songs we talked about the whole weekend. We're like, man, I've just heard that song way too much this weekend. Yeah. Also, it seemed like there was more punk rock than country at some points. That seems like punk. a miss if you're going to Nashville. Not that um, you can't Evan, sprinkle it in, but... Evan could not get enough of Don't Stop Believing. Oh, God. oh we didn't need that ever again. <laughs> don't Stop Believing is over. Um, I, I will not listen to it for a solid two years. I don't need to listen to it for another <laughs> solid two years. It's retired. Um, on top of Grant's point of leaving one bar and going to another one, we were at a bar and they were at like the time of like the cutoff point, and we're on the first floor. Band starts playing. We walk up to the second floor. Band starts playing the exact same song. Yeah, maybe that's happen. what it was. Maybe that's what uh, I was it was thinking both. Of. They were both because it happened on two different occasions. That's fine. Yeah, that is that is something that definitely happened. And while you can request your own song, which I did for Keith Urban because I had to hear it because there was no Kenny or Keith for free. Um, it's just it's not sustainable unless you're like a rich middle aged person who can just control what a band plays with your twenty dollar bills all night. <laughs> correct <laughs> you know yeah those bands gotta be making a killing because it is a lot easier to put in a request when you just have a dj like a dj is not gonna be like, you know it's 20 dollars. i guess some probably do but like a lot of places you could just ask the dj because he's just you know there's less skill and then our good friend drew it guy drew just really wanted to hear firework by katie perry and was told by two pretty solid female singers it might be out of their range like what what are we <laughs> doing here this is nashville baby this is music city if i say play firework by katie perry you dig deep and you sing Katie, you Firework by Katy Perry. Shout out to Drummer in that band who sang ACDC. He was very Great good. performance. Unbelievable. Great performance. Yeah, he needs his own band. He's a breakout player of the year. <laughs> um, we did not see, I've been told, you know, a lot of times in Nashville, you'll see like up and coming artists. I'm not sure we really, I'd classify anyone we saw as an up and coming artist. Um, that is going to be a name to look out for. I couldn't even remember most of the band's names, to be honest with you. No. I only remember one band name. Because you and follow him on Instagram now. I didn't oh, the follow him, but Tanglewood. Ta- that was that. Yeah, that was the last part because we looked him up. Yeah. Well, and they, they had their Instagram on a sign. So. Yeah, and then we were making ourselves feel like we're 10 feet tall by saying how many more followers we had than them. And why aren't we just doing our live show in Nashville? <laughs> oh, we did have double the followers. I would say the band that we listened to for 95% of the time we were in Jason Aldean on the second floor or that roof floor. Um, was probably the Roof. best one. They were good. Um, the band that replaced them was probably could have been just as good. We didn't listen to them long enough. Um, so asterisk there. Um, the last one we went to, what was their name? Tanglewood, Alex? Yep. They were solid. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Mike's need to be a little bit louder, in my, in my opinion. Oh, Honky Tonk Band. They could have been good. I don't know. Couldn't hear him on the mic. We, tr- we tried to help that did. the the lead singer, and she kind of looked at us like that's not my problem. It's like, well, no, it is. We're trying to help. <laughs> we're just trying to help you. Uh, Kid Rock Bar Band was pretty solid at night when we were watching the St. Peter's Purdue game. They were pretty good. 
Uh, yeah, I'll be honest. I don't even remember that music because I was so dialed you in. You were dialed Peter's. in. I feel bad for the people that probably were right across from you sitting <laughs> at their tables trying to enjoy their nice evening meal. And Grant is screaming fight for the St. Peter's Peacocks. <laughs> On oh. National Peacock Day. Negative thing. Cell service. Once you get into bars, you will not be able to load your gambling sites. Um, so rip that if you're ever trying to live bet. Hmm. I think the Valentine bar when we were leaving on the first floor – I think that that band was going to be pretty solid. We only heard a couple songs, but I think that uh, that artist he seemed pretty good in the one song that I saw him play. The Valentine is a good bar if it's sunny out when you're there and you want to. That's your first bar. I like that as a first bar. It's very sunny on that rooftop, and there's got some palm trees, and there's like a little tent. So I think that was a that's a good starter bar. Shout out to Violin to get us oh, started. The on Violinist trip to, trip to Nashville and Tootsie's. Yeah, he yeah. was just. They were making a killing. Yeah, um, yeah, they were. He was standing on top of the bar, walking up and down the bar, just getting tips, and people were throwing money at him. I bet that was actually a really good band, but that place was such an absolute zoo. It was kind of overwhelming as the first like place we went. I think we were like, all right, let's go find somewhere else. Yeah, we, yeah, we kind of like, threw ourselves into the fire right <laughs> off the bat. Um. And then the only thing I had, because obviously on trips, there's like moments and stuff that you'll just giggle about. I said an all-time laugh for me occurred at the pizza place on Friday night morning. That was just a surreal experience oh. to just sit through. <laughs> just like stomach pain laughter of just like what is going on around me. All-time so classic. You leave that place, you wake up in the morning, and you just tell yourself, what happened the last 30 minutes while we were eating? <laughs> Just, it's just every single second in there something different and something weird happened that you're like what am i experiencing right now <laughs> yeah i was speechless at times i was like what is this place i'm dreaming do you have a question for you guys it's i have an answer mm-hmm. saturday night there was some talk in the group that we were washed <laughs> would you guys like to speak oh, on that wow i think right needs to speak first because um it might be at him I think I had, I think I talked it through. I definitely understood where it was coming from, coming from, because it was like 1230. This is kind of a heated debate in the Uber. (laughs) I think, uh, I think my points that I made there at the, uh, the, the downsides is where my mind was that night where like, I just, I knew if we just went to another bar, there was just going to be the same old music situation. And I, at that point I was like ready to. Like if we went to like a bar that had a pool table or darts or uh, you know something that I could like be physically active, I probably would have been like, yeah, let's keep going. Um, but overall, washed. I wouldn't say washed because, like Evan said, I consumed a lot of alcohol over a long stretch of time and really showed no signs of slowing down until twelve thirty. And did we really slow down, or is it more of we're just we're just worn out from this the same thing over and over again? I mean, I don't think I could was physically that. bounce around to music anymore at that point. And then we proceeded to go stay up even longer by playing euchre, and I kept yeah. drinking. So yeah, you did do that, Evan. What do you think? We are not washed. Um, we made the full ten hours that we were out there. Um, <laughs> Yes, we could have been longer. Yes, we're only in Nashville a couple of times in our life. Yes, we will be going back um, in our young lives. Um, but we're still in peak performance. We probably Some people probably think we drink too much. Um, we could have kept on going if we wanted to. So we are far from being washed. On the drinking topic, also shout out you, Grant, for really overdoing it in the pregame, but knowing that you did. And then nursing the same beer for several hours at a bar. It was an all-time move. That, that everyone like caught on to, though. So your your secret is no longer a secret. Well, it's not it's not a secret. It's just, you know, it's just one of those it's, it's a veteran move. Well, it's a move. It's uh give me a like a like, who's a KG veteran in sports? It's a Raj it's a Ra, uh Rajon Rondo playoff move. You know, you just know a Chris Paul, you know, how to draw a foul. Just kind of you pick those up along the way, because then I was like, "Wow, Grant is like the life of the party," because he's carrying us through the pregame. And then it's like, "All right, well now he took his foot off the gas a little bit, Somebody but then you're out and about, us. so other things kind of distract you." Also, I did sing some karaoke, got my toes wet in that, and tequila. As easy as it might be, it still hits people. People enjoy the beat. People did. 
Confirmed. Oh. And we did not get kicked out of that bar. That was other people. So if you saw us there and thought they're pointing at us, they were not. No. Okay. We were allowed to stay as long timing. as we wanted, but we were just out. It was bad timing. Also, I don't think I told you guys um, at the Kid Rock bar, uh, you know, that table to our right, that guy was talking to me. He went to like Penn State. Yep. Dr- Drew, uh, DK looked at the guy because he was talking about Penn State and goes, I f- hate Penn State. <laughs> He looked at that guy and said that. And that guy was pretty big. He looks back at him and says, don't f- talk to me or I'll kick your ass. And then he looked at me and said, tell your friend not to speak. <laughs> and it was very, very awkward. And then he bought me two shots after that. That is intense. It was very strange. I'm glad I was focused on the peacocks. Someone can be a little over aggressive, a little, uh, little stubborn. Oh, yeah. Just ask that kid whose dream school was University of Michigan. Yeah. In the piece of place. <laughs> <laughs> I was also, you know, I was throwing darts at a Wisconsin fan at one point, though. So, well, I would never do, you know, I would never get every I would never get single time Grant saw any Wisconsin gear, he just <laughs> immediate anger. I've never seen someone hate a school over one incident that much, but Grant will hold that to the grave, I think. So, potentially, yeah. But Will Smith just had a bigger slap, so maybe you'll forget about the Juwan slap. I probably would have to get over it if Greg Gard ever became head coach of Michigan. Why, why would that ever happen? I'm, hopefully it doesn't. But I'm just saying, if it did, that would be a reason to get over it. <laughs> Fair. Um, all right. Unless there's anything else you guys want to get off your chest about the trip, we can go to college basketball. No, I'll say my life tip uh, going out to Nashville, beer. Just a nice drink beer all day. It's okay to miss in a couple shots here and there, but don't go for the heavy stuff too soon because then you're going to be hurting later. Um. I was drinking beer all day, every single day. Cheaper to begin with, one. Um, and it just it flows a lot easier. On the flip side, on Friday, I had all Jack and Cokes. And I can agree. <laughs> it was not as good. And, yeah. Headache I'll be the rough. devil on your sh- I'll be the devil on your shoulder if I was the angel. I say you just hit that hard stuff. You hit that brown liquor when you're down there, because that's what that's what they do in Nash Nash oh. Vegas. Shout out the hot dogs we had Friday night. Oh, Mm. Oh, another life advice. Get something in your system, like maybe halfway while you're down there. Don't be like maybe us. Maybe eat food. Yeah. <laughs> don't be like us. That'd be a good idea. And have a fantastic brunch and then don't eat again for another 10 to 12 hours. Don't do this. Yeah. Oh, and hat tip. Um, during the day, obviously, cars are going down. But at night, you should be able to walk down the middle of the road. So take advantage of that because there's no one that walks down the middle of the road. No, it's weird. They block off the did. roads. You can walk right down the middle of Broadway on the roads. It's less and people. It makes you f- and you feel awesome. Yeah, you're like, you wow. Great picture worthy time. You get oh, a picture yeah. of yourself, although be a friend and get a picture for the person that gave you one. Right. Right. Shout out IT guy Drew for snapping all the pictures this weekend because I was in no place to. And if you I have a cowboy hat, hat, if you have a cowboy hat, wear it because cowboy hats slap. I yeah. wish I could pull it off. They just look so much cooler. If you're wearing one in a bar, you just you just look so much cooler. Unless you're the five foot one girl that was standing in front of me. <laughs> her hat just kept falling off into my face. I almost lost my mind. That was a fake cowboy hat, Alex. That had a string on it. I'm talking well, about a real cowboy hat. She had mm. no business wearing that hat. Mm. All right. Now the college basketball hand up. Uh, with all the travel we had, I had to rewatch some of the games today just to get a feel for what actually happened and what storylines came out of this. My first bullet point for what I saw is Evan will love this. He'll be giddy about this. Is that I think this could be a little end of the Gonzaga automatic number one seed run because in four of the last five tournaments they've had a number one seed and I was kind of looking at the recruiting classes and whatnot they're losing Timmy and Holmgren they still have some good players but they only have one recruit for the 2022 class they are number 85 in the country when it comes to classes now they might get transfers but we might see kind of a they might not be that dominant automatic number one seed anymore, especially after their poor performance they put up this tournament. Well, you're forgetting one thing, Grant. What? Um, they're still going to pretty much go near undefeated in their conference, so their record's still going to be like 30-3. and three. I don't disagree with that, but we saw Houston get a five seed this year because I think maybe they were like, okay, we're going to value your conference more. So I think maybe if they lose some of that luster, Gonzaga may not be getting those auto ones. Eh, we'll see. I'm not. I'm not sold on that. A man can. A man can dream. It doesn't matter if you beat him. True. 
It's just, well, it's just easier for them to make runs when you're always a one seed. Yeah, well, they didn't make a run. St. Peter's now has more top three seed wins over the last 20 years than Gonzaga does. Because Gonzaga's always a high seed. They don't have to play anybody tough. They get luckily get to play a 16 or a 15. Upsets aren't likely. They do happen, as we saw, but unlikely. Um, and then they get a cakewalk, you know, eight, nine seeds, you know, could be competitive, but it's all about the draw. So this year's no difference. I've been telling you all year, Gonzaga's overrated, and they are. Um, Drew Timmy's a liability on defense and ball screen defense and iso- isolation. And Chad Holmgren's still one of the most overrated prospects I've ever witnessed in my life. Evan, don't let the bias get in your way of Chad. There is no bias. It's just the facts. I'll give you, I'll give you the Timmy defense. But Chad it's just is the a facts. good player. Just the facts, Alex. Just the facts. Is he a good player? Uh, he's overrated. I'm not arguing that he's a good, solid player, but he's Is he overrated. better than Joey Hauser? Tell the people. No, he's not. Joey Hauser would average well into the double figures in the West Coast Conference. Joey Clip Hauser would man. average 16 and 8 easily. He would roll out of bed <laughs> Alex, getting 15 points. Alex, Alex, you made Evan say this exact same thing last show. I'm, I'm going to have him do it. Day. I'm going to have him do it every show so that people remember this forever. I think Chet being a bust in the NBA would be the biggest victory lap of this podcast history. Oh my gosh. I, I think can't it would be the biggest thing. Um, jumping off the St. Peter's point, cause you brought them up. Purdue. Yikes. Gift wrapped an elite eight appearance to finally get that final four. They've been craving and their um, <laughs> love child. Jay and Ivy was an absolute no show in their biggest game of the year. So that is um, tough for the boilers. And I just, simply, when people like are like, oh, Purdue, 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 and I never take them seriously, this would be another example of why. I'm not sure Purdue would have beat North Carolina anyways, but has it really been since 1980 that they went to the Final Four? Yeah, go look uh, at the picture that's surfing all over Twitter. That's the one I saw. They only have one championship in 1932. It's yeah. And a f- one that Final Four basketball. in 1980. Yeah, it's not good, man. Matt Painter's really one of the good. most overrated coaches in of our generation, and we're still good regular always season will be. coach. You uh, have yeah. a layup a to get to the Elite Eight. Yes, wait I don't know if they would have beat North wait Carolina. Um, They're hot right now. Yes, but you have a layup to get no, to the Elite Eight again, and you yeah, no, pissed it away. You there. blew it. Shout out to St. Peter's though; they played a fantastic game. Um, they were down. They made some they ridiculous just, shots. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only game I really saw this weekend. So. Yeah, I'm seeing. I am. Yeah, 1980. That is, that is that's, mind blowing. That's really, really for, bad for how everyone talks about them every year about being like a nice, good program. Well, and I've been a Final this, Four in my life. This 32 championship is not even like the NCAA tournament. It's called like the Primo Peretta champion or the Helms champion. They were NCAA tournament runner ups in 1969. Uh, they don't have a title. I don't really even care about that. I think they haven't met to a final four in our lives and barely in our own dad's lives. Yeah. That's why they like, they, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say they, they rise to their feet and give a loud applause whenever they see Gene Keedy because they really appreciate that man and what he did. He did w- one thing. I was going to say credit to me for sucking that in. But you did. You did just say it. I mean, it is also pretty, um, it is really hard to get to Final Fours, whether people know it or not. It doesn't feel like that for our programs, you know. Not that we're just going to chop every team in Indiana, but the Hoosiers haven't made it since 2002. So I'm just going to throw that out there. At well. least that's in our life, Grant. Are they a basketball school? There's one basketball school that's been there more recent. That's the Butler Bulldogs. Butler has yes. been there twice. Purdue uh, if you guys it. are really bored, you can go onto the Butler Cole- Collegiate and search probably, if you put in my name, Grant Anschutz and butler indiana you'll probably find an, a column i wrote why butler is the best team in the state of indiana now this was a couple years ago so that that has since changed but because mike bright at notre dame said we that notre dame has been the most consistent program in um They've indiana good when i was in college and i just absolutely eviscerated his point and um proved with stats i, I mean i went in the weeds i went by nba selections you know like tournament runs, regular season titles, all that stuff. Baller was by far the best back then. You have and showed me that article several times. <laughs> where, um, where can Duke. I find it on? 
<laughs> the the Butler, Butler Collegian. Collegian. Oh. Okay. 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 We'll, I'll we'll, see if I can we'll make my way. I'll see if I can find the title for you as we talk. For Duke, the Dukies are a huge story. And everyone's talking about Coach K. I want to talk about, or not talk about, but I just want to give love to Jeremy Roach and Mark Williams because those guys are playing phenomenal basketball right now. And I believe they're the two they're two sophomores on Duke because they, they were there last year. And so it's kind of interesting to see, you know, Duke has gone the one and done freshman phenom route. And those two sophomores are really elevating their game and, and helping them make a run in this tournament. I'm sorry. Jeremy Roach. Is, I was Jeremy Roach is looking at your article. <laughs> Jeremy Roach, especially man. I found what your bread. You find? I found your bread and God an article. All right, yeah. The uh, this is the headline: the last 15 years in Indiana basketball have belonged to the Butler Bulldogs. <laughs> wow, that's aggressive. Let me see. This was. Uh, we should tweet oh, this, this out on our account so people can see it. This is from December 6, 2016, so different era. Yes, I said, Notre Dame's head coach Mike Bray raised eyebrows after praising his program a few days before last year's Crossroads Classic. Quote, we're the most consistent program in this state, and it isn't even close, Bray told reporters during a press conference <laughs> before Notre Dame's matchup against Indiana. And then I basically just eviscerated him and talked about how in since 2000, Notre Dame has appeared in the NCAA tournament 11 times, whereas the schools have done 10 and 9. And then I talked about the runs that like they had made it eleven times, but they simply, you know. Well, Butler stinks then. Oh, I found it. Yeah, it's changed now. Since two thousand, the Butler Bulldogs have been the best college basketball team in Indiana. The reasoning is simple. They thrived in March. With nineteen NCAA tournament wins in two final fours, which led to two national championship game appearances. The Butler Bulldogs are the clear number one choice. They were also four and one against those teams via the Crossroad Classics. It's icing on the cake. And then I said the debate is settled. Get bodied, Mike Bray. Wow. Evan, I put the link in the uh, the show. I think you accidentally deleted it. No, you found I, it. I just I just put yep. it in there. Yep, 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 yep. So yep. take take a look at that when you get bored. Oh yeah, I will. I'm gonna copy and paste it into a new tab right now. <laughs> um, another uh, observation. Uh, I don't know what you just said, Grant, so I'm sorry if I repeat. I talked about Jeremy Roach and Mark Williams are incredible. Fair. Agreed. From Duke. I was going to say it feels like this is just going to be the the perfect ride into the sunset, Coach K garbage that no one wants. It does, really feels it like feel that's that happening. Um, they He's have not even stars. coaching. They have superstar teams. They usually don't make it this far. Is it going to be another Kentucky repeat where they're all like five stars, one and dones? Um, I don't know. But it is a little. Let's just say gave them the best test. Uh, Texas Tech gave up a good fight, but offensively they're just not there. Defensively they are. Uh, and then Arkansas just ran a gas. I don't think offensively they're there either. They're athletic, but. Duke it's crazy. Duke, Duke could say had a chance in the round of 32 to end this this dream run. It does feel that way a little bit, Alex, but I would say like it, I'm going to feel that way if they win on Saturday because if they win very, the semifinal, they're going to win it all. That's what I think. I feel like I'll just mentally be, all right, Duke's going to win it, but if they lose to North Carolina after what happened with Coach K, it's going to like flip so fast from like a dream Final Four run to like embarrassed again by the same team who beat you on your senior night and coach K's last Cameron indoor game like that in that rivalry that will live on forever. Also, I saw people are not excited for a Duke North Carolina rematch in the final four. Personally, I am very jazzed for it. I think it's awesome. I'm not jazzed for it. Come on. It's a Evan. fantastic rivalry. Evan. I understand it's a fantastic rivalry, but I am, I am, I am the, excited for it. I'm also the person that doesn't like the full on like media, just overload that, it's already like it's deserved, yes, because it's the final four. It's the biggest stage for college basketball. But I don't need other people like chiming in and just like giving it down my throat. I don't want it. I don't need it. Like it's almost too much. I want it. Well, I want this. You could could just turn off your TV this week and then just turn it on when the game <laughs> tips. You're like, all right, I'm just well, when I turn it on, make sure everyone's on TBS. It's not on CBS. The final four is on TBS. Title games oh, on wow. TBS too. No, uh, I saw that earlier. What the. F- French. I can't even process that. Um. Yes, I understand. I recognize it. I respect it. Just 
the media coverage I mean, is going to come from it. I don't need it all. I don't need it, it's, them to talk about the, how good Coach K is because we all know it, and he's been doing the same thing for the last 60 years. It's the second best rivalry in college athletics, and to get that in the Final Four is massive. Oh, yeah, I get it. I understand it. It's going to be like the most watched Final Four game of all time. It's weird like, they put it as the late game, but like imagine if Michigan and Ohio State played in the college football playoff. It'd be insane. This is if, like what if that Michigan is. and Michigan State played in the college bath in Final Four. It'd be, be insane. It would I'm be just nuts. glad this game's not on ESPN because every other commercial would just be the Coach K and North Carolina commercial. Like it at was least we won't have a Coach K versus. cam. Can you imagine how sick to our stomachs? Like I'm trying to think about Duke and North Carolina fans. There's a lot of bandwagon Duke ones that don't really even they just jumped on because you know they're like oh they're sweet but like for the diehards like how sick to our stomachs that we would all be if it was michigan michigan state in a final four all week like you wouldn't be able to like sleep you'd be like not wanting to eat food because like you you want it because if you win it would be so glorious but if you lose like there was a real moment when i didn't want i was like i don't really want ohio state to beat villanova because i don't want to even just think about losing to ohio state in the sweet 16 like i just want i'd rather just lose it's a loser mentality but like you just feel that way like you don't want that embarrassment yeah i agree also I why does the national game. championship tip off at 9 30 ew where's it play that day new orleans new which orleans. is east coast 9 30 It's ridiculous. Um, I can't wait to fall the, asleep to that. That'd be cool. On the UNC side of things, Caleb Love needs a shout out. That kid's playing phenomenal oh, basketball, yeah. and he Good is point. that dude. Dagger in my yeah. face on Friday night. Unbelievable. Sorry, Evan. Yeah, he had. What about I Armando? Like, I think he made like four three pointers in like the last ten minutes of the game, or something like that. Like he was just step back city. And uh, no re- repeats for Final Four participants. A lot of them got bounced uh, this weekend. So over like under fresh Final Four. The amount of times we see Roy Williams on camera on Saturday. Give me a line. I'll set it at 11 and a half. Over. Like, just during the game. They show him, like, all game long. Because he's always right behind the bench. You would think like it's when still they used his to, team. When they would show uh, Mick Cronin's dad last year during their run. <sighs> yeah. Who's the guy uh, that they always show for Villanova? Raleigh Massimino. Yeah, yeah they show him a thousand times villanova was a, i know people are like doing the whole like oh the blue blood final four but like i don't know about villanova villanova is for sure like a blue blood at least in my mind because it's just been so recent and they have that 1985 title like that when i think about the best program in college basketball my mind goes like top five villanova that's probably because i'm a big east fan so but but i think they definitely belong they belong i don't know who would say they don't i guess I, maybe at least like, the they don't new have blood that. Like they're a much more respectable basketball program than Indiana. I don't care about the history of Indiana. Way like Villanova's legit. Indiana's a clown show. Villanova's legit. Yeah. Um. Speaking of that, uh, Michigan lost to them. Their season is over. Uh, it was a gross game. I'm gonna give us credit. I thought we had a great system in the car to maximize everyone's enjoyability. It took some working out because you know I did the classic to Alex where I said I wouldn't. I would try not to get too worked up in the car. His exact um, words were, "I won't." say anything or yell and then about five minutes into the game he was screaming i deleted two beers before tip off which was pretty fast and then um i was like you know what this this game's pretty pretty intense because that going into the point michigan looked like as good of a team if not better at times in the game and so our 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 system that worked great was um the the front row would have a game on at a little bit uh ahead a couple like a second or two ahead of mine that way when i yelled you know, I wasn't spoiling anything because I had my headphones in, so I couldn't really hear anything you guys said about the game before I yelled. Um, but as I said in the post game recap, this game felt very similar to the UCLA loss in last year's Elite Eight, where a little bit different, obviously, because the expectations um, in the tournament itself for last year's Michigan team were higher. Where okay, UCLA is just like long shot first four team, you should beat them. But the style of the game was very similar, where slow possessions good defense all around and then just missing bunnies and 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 free throws they were 12 of 29 on layups and dunks now obviously 
I'd probably just layups. I don't think they really missed any dunks, but all contested shots. They're not, we're not talking about like wide open transition layups, but still like when you're within that little, you know, the restricted area of the paint, you want to be making those, at least getting friendly rolls. And they missed a lot of free throws too. So it was just disgusting. They, they ultimately fell short of my lofty final four expectation goals. You know, I said, you could, we talk about what the goals of the season were. I said, final four, um, they did not reach that. So tough. Uh, my game recap, um, you touched on a little bit, um, not capitalizing on opportunities when they were there. I feel like Michigan's defense, for the most part, was pretty solid. Um, isolation kind of got lost here and there. depends on matchups. Um, but they did force Villanova into a lot of tough and difficult long threes or long jump shots that you kind of want in a tournament game. But on the other end, Michigan didn't capitalize to scoring in certain certain situations. I'm not saying they have to go on long runs, but just a bucket here and there goes goes a long ways when you're call, talking about like one or two possessions um, at the end of the game. And then obviously Villanova doesn't miss free throws. Um, you did force them into a couple of turn, turnovers at the end, and if it was a closer game, you never know what could have happened. Um, mm. Obviously, Brooks was the leading guy. I mean, D- Dickinson was there. Um you touched on it. The bunnies miss at the rim was the most infuriating or devastating thing, I think, for a Michigan fan. Um, and Villanova wasn't even playing their best. It's not like you got blown out by 35. Um, it's one of those games where you wish you had back and you wish you had obviously played better in it because it was winnable for sure. Mm. For me, um, my viewing experience was much different. I was driving, so all my points are going to be the same as Grant and Evans because that's what I heard out loud from them while the game was going on. (laughs) So based on that, a transcript, Michigan could not make easy shots. Grant was yelling at that repeatedly. Um, Evan needed Eli Brooks to make some threes, and it took a long time, but he finally did. Mm Mm-hmm. People uh, were wondering if Evan was a Michigan fan at one point. Evan or did cheer for Eli Brooks a little bit. No, I was I cheering think he for yelled, points. I think he yelled a Mike Breen bang on one <laughs> of did. Eli Brooks' threes. He did. He did. <laughs> um, also, Evan was getting a little upset that Villanova couldn't hit shots for long periods of time. It um, went five minutes at one point in the first half without a bucket. I remember vividly Grant getting upset that Gillespie was in his bag for a minute. And Evan was very excited about that because of his bets. Gillespie's an unbelievable player. No, not unbelievable. No, he's not. He's not unbelievable. You've he's already very... said unbelievable during this show three times. <laughs> really? Yeah. You say, it, you say it so much. Gillespie is a well-rounded, crafty basketball player. He's a really good player. With an, with an absolute strap for a three-point. Er. And then... Uh, then it was a weird, weird stretch at the end where Grant... Was mm. understanding that the game was Game's over. over. He was okay with it. He is. He was processing, moving on, and then all of a sudden, tons of excitement in the backseat. I didn't know what was happening, and Grant thought there was uh, there was life again because of a couple turnovers and some threes or whatever. And then he just went right right back to darkness. And then it didn't really hit me until uh, Evan and Drew were in their naps, and I was just reading Twitter, and it was just Alex and I were awake, and I was, you're like, "What are you doing back there, Grant?" I'm like, "I'm reading it's all like the mean 30, things Michigan State fans said." On, Thirty online. minutes of silence, and then Grant finally speaks, and he's like, "I looked at Twitter. It's not good." <laughs> um, I had a theory that came to me from this game, from this game, the UCL game. When it comes to tournament losses, especially, I feel like these games where your team that you root for has a lack of offense, they sting way more than when your team just has a lack of defense. Now, I want to get your thoughts on that because, like, for example, I mean, it even goes into your guys' game, like Michigan State's game versus Duke. You can, in your head, you're like, well, Duke just made more shots. And yes, like the defense lacked at times where they got to the rim a lot, but like, you as a fan, you're like, well, they just hit their threes and they blew by our defenders. But like, when I watch Michigan just not be able to make layups and it's just a lack of offense, that just hits so much worse because you're like, damn, like you, you you like to think, okay, you can just make those close shots. Whereas sometimes like, all right, I guess their guards are just too fast and we can't stay in front of them and our defense stinks. Anemic offensive performances are the worst. It's just, it's just so deflating all game long because every time a shot goes up, you're like, oh, that's not going to go. Oh, that's not going to go. And then you're like, oh, it has to go now. We've missed 20 shots in a row. 
doesn't go again. And you're just like, ugh. I would much rather make a bunch of shots, have this crazy fast-paced game like the Duke game, and lose than lose scoring 50 or less points like Michigan has like three years in a row. Yeah. It actually has been, yeah, because you go back to the Texas Tech Sweet 16, they scored like 45. I think we scored like 50 against Texas Tech. That was pretty deflating. I would agree to that um, because, especially in Sweet 16, um, you kind of have like a week off to prepare and you'd hope you put your best game plan forward. And if somebody's just like unconscious or the team's hot from shooting, you kind of tip your cap to them on the defensive side. Well, when you're not making shots, it's like, okay, what were we doing all week? Why can't we make the small adjustments like the elder team? Why can't we just score? Um, to where it seems like it's an easy concept, obviously it can be difficult. So I think it's more infuriating if you're not hitting shots than if you're giving up a bunch of points. And it's even worse if like, so like when Michigan played UCLA, the I don't know the final score, but they couldn't hit anything either. So then you really just think in your head, wow, if we could just hit like two more shots, or if we just played a like normal like we did all season, we probably win that game by like double digits. Yeah, that that final score was fifty to forty nine. Yeah, yeah, that's just like throw up in your mouth. And you had like four shots within the last minute to try to win it, and then you missed them all. Yeah. Um. There was one moment we like to bookmark big moments in games, and it's weird that mine came in the first half of this, but I said it to you guys in the moment. So, Devontae Jones went on like a mini five zero run himself. He had like a fast break layup and then hit a three off the dribble. So Michigan was up 22 to 20 with three minutes and 50, 50 seconds to go in the first half. Villanova was in the middle of their five minute scoring drought. And then Dickinson jumped on a land on two pump fake by Jermaine Samuels and got two fouls. And that kind of like stretched it when I always say good teams finish halves well. Like if Michigan had a lot of momentum there to go on a run, and if they could put together like six more points on that run, you're you're up 28 to 20. And then just kind of the feeling of the game going into halftime is better. And then if Villanova makes a second half run, you're still only down a couple. And then it turned in, you know, without that, Michigan gets down nine at one point in the second half. But surprisingly enough, when I was watching back today, the reason I got so excited, I realized, is because it, it was a four-point game with two minutes and 30 seconds to go. Um, Villanova had the ball, but, like, I kind of forgot it was, like, really that tight there. You know, it's a, it's a two-possession game. You get a stop, you get a score, then you're right in it. But ultimately, you know, Villanova, like we talked about, they're the best free-throw shooting team in the country. So when you get down to them by nine, you're like, this is this is a very uphill battle to get back in this game. Also, didn't Michigan, I don't know if this was said, but didn't Michigan miss a bunch of free throws in the beginning of the game? Oh, yeah. I think uh, the they, they missed at least seven free throws, I think. Um, yeah, and I think you said last week on the show that Michigan needs to shoot really well from the line, and then right away they just did not. Yeah, like when you, especially when you play a Villanova, like you know they're not going to give away points at the line, so you're going to have to not also do that because then that's how they beat you by like 10, you know, and they won, they won by eight. And I think Michigan missed seven free throws gross or something like that let me get the oh yeah seven of 14 so 50 percent oh. as a team from the line it's just really bad um bad. all right but that is the season so now we'll do a little season in review we'll we'll pivot to michigan state here and we did a little bit for michigan state since we talked about them last show with guest luke but we can go into i kind of broke it down into categories and you guys can pick and choose what you actually want to hammer home they're just kind of idea starters if you want to sum up the season and then talk about what you'd like to happen next. Um, but yeah, I'll leave this. I do have two questions for you guys at some point in here, but I'll leave it up to you guys for anything you'd like to say about when you think about this Michigan state season as a whole. I'm just going to list two themes. Um, consistent energy level this year was not good. And the mm-hmm. other theme was this, the rebounding compared to previous seasons was just not the same. There was a bit of a drop off, so those are both negative. So Evan, give it, give some positive themes. Positive themes. Um, mm. <laughs> kind of positive tough. themes. Guard play um, still dominates this team. Um, we're at best when we have elite point guard play. We have potential to have two solid point guards. Um, they both developed throughout the season very well. Um, some. My biggest theme, I would say, was the inconsistent of being inconsistent. Um, it's a roller coaster emotional of the season. You know, the highest high of being superly highly ranked and potential to win the Big Ten to um, you need to win versus Purdue at home to get off the bubble line. Uh, 
But there Bright are spot that three pointer. Yeah. Um, it's a Michigan State season, so what do you expect? We are going to lose some games that we're, not, we're we should win, and then we're going to win games that we shouldn't. Um, but when now and you still made the tournament, sort of a successful year. Yeah, you don't want to. You try to make it to the second weekend. Um, obviously, we're our goal is Final Four and national championships, but it's college basketball. I think my quick two themes tie in both yours. I wrote bright spot. There's some guard play to build off of for the future. And then downside, there was a lack of toughness, which kind of fits into Alex's rebounding point. Like when I was doing more research on older Michigan state teams, they just have that grit to them that seemed like it was missing from this team. Um, What I want to know from you guys is what do you need to see from this Michigan state team next year? to not have doubts in your head about Coach Izzo's fastball? Well, I, As in, d- like, has he, I don't like, have you know, doubts right now. So let's just... No, right. But, well, that's that's what I'm saying. Uh, what do I need to see so I don't have doubts? Or what uh, What if I see something, will I have doubts? I, I guess that would you... Yeah, I think you'd... Wouldn't that be... Answer? I think that would... If the energy you know level and the, the toughness is poor... Next season, I will start to question. I'm not I'm never going to say he needs to be fired. I'm just probably not going to do that. So don't don't ever ask me that. But if the toughness and like the grit that you mentioned is still lacking, then I'll just wonder what changed. I'll at least ask some questions. Mm. So yours is more just like nothing X's and O's. It's and just, nothing like results oriented. Like, what if it's the hardest playing team? They just can't make shots. If they can't make shots, it's not. I mean, it's not it's the X's and O's. It's the Jimmy and Joes. If they can't make shots, yeah. And then I what mean, if, if like you're they missing play, like, shots? I mean, what are you going to do? And then what if they play like no transition defense and don't box out, but they make every three and make the final four? Well, then we're going to overlook things if they get to the final four. <laughs> okay i just didn't know but like, those, you were, like, like you went, those are so extreme that i don't see either happening where so you, the, you don't have any like results in your head you don't have top four big 10 finish second weekend of the tournament you have just like does this team give a when they play basketball if this team gives a and can on play to their potential they're not going to be a bad team you, you danced around that but they this year they okay. didn't have great toughness. They were not consistent, and at the end of the day, they were still a above average team that made the tournament and had a decent shot to go to the Sweet Sixteen at the end of the day. So if you just have better energy every game, consistent, and you play tough, they have plenty of talent. It's not like they lack talent. They're not Northwestern. Mm, chop, uh, Evan. I'll give you the how- answers that you are looking for, Grant. Um, <laughs> oh, you're laying on me. Well, you can't just too, say. I'm not going to go too extreme right now because I don't know what the roster is going to look like. Um, but I would say you need to get back into the top five in the Big Ten, competing for first in the Big Ten down the stretch the last two weeks of the season where we were going in the reverse way. Um, and second, you need to make it to the second weekend. You need to make a Sweet 16. Um, yes, it's not that good of a goal. Yes, we should actually be saying we need to make it to the Final Four. But then again, I don't know what the roster is going to look like. I don't know what the college basketball landscape is going to look like. Um, but I would say that you need to compete for the Big Ten Championship again, and you need to get to the second weekend. Yeah, I think it's really hard to say strict goals like that or strict requirements when we don't know, like you said, who's going to be on the team who's leaving for the NBA of other teams, who's who's in the conference. We don't even know who we play in the non-conference. But Alex, a as a program, things. as a yes. dominating basketball we should program, always we should have to lost the expectations. Correct. And it's not bad to say that no matter who's on your roster. Yes, and we with, should be competing with the Big Ten Championship every single year. We should be making it to the Sweet 16 75% of the years. And recently we have not been doing – the tournament wise, we have had success in the Big Ten, but it hasn't translated. Yes, we got one season robbed of us, and yes, uh, we made it to the Final Four in 2019, which is only three years ago. But it should be year in and year out. You should be able to get to the Sweet 16. Look at Villanova, um, North Carolina. You know, look at some of the teams, other other teams around the country that can do the same thing. Houston made it to an Elite Eight and a Final Four in back to back years. 
I, I don't think it's unattainable by any means. I expect all those things. And I think they will compete for that kind of stuff next year. The latest mock draft, since we're, we have to speculate a little bit, that I looked at uh, has Max Christie slotted around the 41st pick in the draft if he were to go. So a middle, early, mid, second rounder to the Minnesota Timberwolves. What are your, what's your guys' gut feeling say today about Max Christie's future with the Spartans? Uh, I also should say I saw <sighs> some rumblings Don't. today. Don't. Oh. It's unnecessary. Those people lie. About A.J. Hogarth. Well, you you saw Hogard. It's all clickbait. You can believe what, what was you it, want. Alex? I just saw that. Go ahead. Izzo and Hogard's relationship uh, has not been great this season, and then they pointed to us pursuing the LSU point guard grad transfer, and that there's talk of AJ Hogard transferring. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Wow. I don't think it will happen, but that is what I saw today. For Max wow. Christie, that would be that would hurt the Alex Gillen brand hard. I would be pretty upset. Uh, for you'd Max be a Christie, be, if I be. had to say right now, I'm going to just move on from the solution. Uh, if Max Christie right now, I say he'll be wearing the green and white next season, seventy thirty. And you want that to confirm? I think yeah, he could make a big jump. Yes, I want Max Christie to return. I think he should, based off of his Big Ten play. Um, had a couple solid games here and there, but the consistency wasn't there. Um, the shooting consistency wasn't there as like he was in the non-conference. Um, is the long season. Is the Big Ten play. Everybody goes through it. Um, but I would like him. I think he can develop a lot more. We saw from Gary Harris, second-year guy. Miles Bridges improved his status or his overall basketball game. I don't know about his his draft position but um but then again i don't Johnny like the kid if he's gonna get drafted keegan murray correct there's other examples but i was thinking about in in-house examples and um recent news that hit the conference today do either of you want andre Corbello in the green and white next year no i mean i wouldn't mind him he's a solid basketball player um, just don't see a spot for him if Walker and Hogard are still on the team. Hogard transfers to Penn State. Do you want Curbelo on Why the, the team? Why the f*** would Hogard go to Penn State? I just wanted to rattle you. He's from <laughs> Pennsylvania. Goes, oh, I didn't know Jesus that, but that's Christ. huge. He'd probably go to Houston. Hogard transfers to VCU. Who? Wow, you must think he stinks. Well, I do. Do you want Curbelo no. on your team? There is always a spot for more talent on your roster, even with everybody coming back. Um, but Evan, I think you're, he, you're he's a big leaving Illinois guy? because he didn't play. Why would he come here and play? Not that he'll play, but he wouldn't play a ton. He wouldn't be a forty minute guy. I think he didn't play because of some. He got well. He got a huge concussion. Has it all a long time. And then I think like the culture fit. I don't think him and Underwood got along because Underwood didn't like some of his flashy passes. He was benched the entire second half of their final game. Which completely illustrates my point. He didn't yeah. not play because he's bad. He pl- didn't play because him and the coach, I don't believe, saw eye to eye at the end. Correct. Okay, so hearing those things, do I really want him? I mean, talent is talent. Um, but is he a fit here? I don't know. Izzo's never been a guy to change his philosophy or on one player. Um, it's kind of you fit our philosophy, and you can see where it gets you. Does, do I think he's a fit? Probably not. But I wouldn't be upset if he was wearing green and white next year. If he was on a roster, I wouldn't be disappointed. I don't think there's any chance he'll be on our roster. Wow. No chance. No chance. I don't think we'll even reach out. Yeah, guys usually don't transfer within the Big Ten. I feel like. I could be wrong about well, that. Well, Wheeler feel like went to, from Penn State to Ohio State. so mm. A Purdue could try to come to Michigan, and then he got shot down. Uh, who the kid on Michigan Spike went from Michigan to Purdue, to Purdue and Doc went, went to OSU to OSU. So I, it yeah, definitely happened. I guess we're not. Those aren't. No offense. Those aren't game changing players. Like John Cabella can change. Harar or Hera, Hera, John, whatever. He uh he almost went to MSU last year, that but he returned to Penn State. Speaking of the transfer portal, is there any like new names you like, or more importantly, names that you don't want any part of, or? When you look, when you look at the future, 
Oh, Texas Ted Tech kid and entered like two days ago. He's he was really good. He's like the number one available transfer by the Evan Mia transfer portal rankings. He'd be cool. And we both of our schools reached out, but I don't see us getting him. But that's the I, only like new one that I would be interested in. Obviously, probably some transfers are going to come in. I would like to see still be a post player. Um, and I kind of have faith in the transfers from the transfers that Michigan State has gotten in the past and in the present. Um, they've all turned out pretty solid. Uh, so I don't really have anybody's names or whatnot because it's it's up really? in the air. Obviously, you want as many talented guys on your roster as possible. I think there's with experience. A hundred percent chance Michigan State brings in one, and like a seventy percent chance they bring in two guys from the portal. Mm. But especially 100, if AJ Hogarth's leave, especially if Hogarth's leaving. I didn't say. I think he will. First I reported just, by Alex Gillen via the dark web. Just telling you what I saw. I don't think he'll leave. Uh, <laughs> um. All right. Now for the same kind of format for Michigan, their season in review. Um, the big theme for me, I kind of told you guys this in the car ride at some point, but this the season taught me to never fall for preseason rankings again in any sport, which I think will be great for my mental health, just to simply not care about what that first poll says and then just watch the team I root for with my eyes and watch them compared to other basketball teams and be like, okay, well, this team I think can be good or bad. And it was definitely a good moment because this season was – a new experience into the life of that high ranking and then a bunch of McDonald's All-Americans. That's not something that John Beeline did. That's not something he ever went through. He was a three to four year developer, two years like if you're Trey Burke and really good, but never like a one and done type of deal for the most part, unless I'm missing an obvious person. Um, I guess Ignis left after Mitch one McGarry. year. He did leave and he should not have. Yeah. Because of the weed. But but uh yeah so that was just a brand new experience where you you were relying on guys like that and i learned my lesson to not buy into all the media hype that Evan warns us about so that is good for my mental health this year of not falling for those tricks anymore um any themes that stood out to you from the rival school consistency similar to michigan state's program just a lot of up and downs Win, loss, win, loss. Never seemed to put it all together. I guess tournament, they did win two games in a row. But <laughs> One of the biggest off-court scandals in program history. <laughs> Just snuck in there towards the end of the year. It was a wild year, really. Yeah, yeah. A really, really weird season for Michigan. Just a lot of hype. So it'll probably mm-hmm. be good for them, hopefully, to not have a gajillion top five distractions. Mm-hmm. And you touched Unless, on it with like relying on people. Sorry, Alex, go ahead. No, you're good. Um, I would say like depth on your roster isn't wasn't the same this year as it was previous years. Um, some people coming off the bench kind of weren't really um, trusting or reliable to either valuable minutes or even point production. Um, so relying on people and then like the whole depth thing, I would say that was the biggest theme I would see from this team. On top of Evan's yeah. depth point, um, there were a couple guys you expected to take a leap into the season. Like Brandon Johns came off a hot tournament. You th- everyone thought, you know, he's going to be good. So maybe just more uh, development because he got worse and he was bad. Mm-hmm. It's just one example, yeah. but it felt like there wasn't a lot of guys that took another step other than Dickinson. But yeah, he, he definitely was, didn't reach – he didn't reach his ceiling or his form from the NCAA tournament, Johns. It felt like towards the end there, it maybe was a little too late. Like Terrence Williams had a little coming out party. He did late, yes. Um, of sorts, so you would look for that next year. As we look to the future of this team, um, I was looking, trying to get caught up on all the transfer portal stuff today. My wish list, my grocery list for this team, now obviously it depends on, I guess we can start then with who's for sure leaving. We know Devontae Jones is gone. Eli Brooks is gone. Brandon Johns could come back for a fifth year, but I, I'm mentally counting him as gone. Um, I was wrong. I thought he was a junior for this whole time. He's a senior. so. But and he has an extra qu- year of eligibility. Yeah, I think he gets the COVID year. Yes, yeah, so everybody has an extra year. So, so he could. Grad transfer, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but the three question marks are Dickinson, 
Diabate, and Houston. And on that same mock draft site, I found Christian. I did not see Houston or Diabate listed, but I have seen them like maybe a week or two ago in them. So I think that's up in the air. I think all three of those guys will go through the NBA testing process that you're like legally allowed to do now with the option to come back, I would imagine. Um, I just feel like, like with, I'm not, I feel like w- with seeing Luca Garza, we kind of see what Dickinson's ceiling or like blueprint would be for him in the NBA, like kind of bouncing up between the two levels. And cause like when it comes to that pick and roll defense that the NBA does, it's just, you saw it in the Villanova game. Like there's just going to be guys like Jermaine Samuels who were six, seven, who can still get their shots off against a bigger guy. Cause they know how to play like that. So I think that limits his ceiling, but it's almost like he like cashed the check. Like, you know, when he announced he was coming back, he said one last ride. He talked all the smack this year to opposing fan bases to kind of say like, hey, I'm never going to see them again. So I'm just going to be be my villain self and then leave and ride out. It's almost like he's done too much to come back. But obviously, like in his mind, well, I'm just going to take this NIL money and come back another year. Um, but I feel like at least after his Tennessee performance kind of helped with making some threes, his draft stock could be about as high as it's going to get. Like if he comes back another year, I don't know if his draft stock is going to get any higher. You guys know what I'm saying? Like I, I think like he's reached is, it. Like Miles Bridges, what, the same thing. He came back and nothing was going to change. It was just he wanted to come back. Like what more is? I guess the right hand could still be worked on. You could three point percentage could come up a little bit, but you kind of are what you are in today's NBA for him. So I do feel like in my gut he will he will leave. Um, I would say it's probably like an eighty percent chance, maybe like a twenty percent. He's like, oh, I guess he'll come back, but. He's 93rd the, in the top 100 of prospects. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what it will look like. I don't I, I don't know how drafting works or whatever, but he might just be like, I'll go get paid overseas or something. I have no idea. That would be weird. Uh, to, well, Nick Ward left. You never know. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the two freshmen, I could be more like coin flip on those guys. Like, they might, especially both of them because they're very young. Like, also the thing with Dickinson is the NBA is really big on drafting you when you're young, and he's... 20 i believe so you know the more he stays around 21. the worse his stock the worse his stock will get if he's like 22 or 23 when he leaves whereas houston same with christie they both should have been seniors in high school this past year so their their clock is still very young where like hey you can come back um but obviously the portal all depends on who stays and goes we know that but overall regardless of that i would like to see them get a solid wing player i'll say but more of a shooting guard a guy that can knock down threes consistently kind of can you need to replace Eli Brooks's three point percentage in a way. Um, the guy could even be like a Shondi Brown guy, where you know he's good at defense. He can knock down a couple threes a game if you need him to. And then I would really like to see because what we lack this year is a like stretch four um, that can knock down threes as well. I'm thinking about I, I look at what Brady Maddox doing at North Carolina, and I want that on my team. I want like a four who's like six eight, six seven, uh, who can make threes reliably and stretch out of defense. Because in my dream. You know, if I'm thinking about who's coming back, if if Dickinson's gone in my mind and Diabate comes back, I want Diabate to play the center position. And then I just want to have like shooters kind of scattered around would be my goal. Um, but if both those guys leave, then Michigan will have to hit the portal to find a big man like Michigan State because then they'll just have Terrace Reed, a freshman, as their center, which you can't just bank on being good right away. So it's going to get interesting there. It kind of makes they kind of need the guys to make decisions to, to know what they want out of the portal. But the two names I looked at to be those guys would be, there's this guy from, I think it's St. Joe's, which was Martelli's old school. So there could be some connections there to recruit him. Taylor Funk from St. Joe's. He's got a cool name, Evan. We got the Funk, as we were seeing in Nashville. We He's got a six, the Funk. The Funk. Gotta have that Funk. He's a 6'8", white guy, power forward. He uh, took over 200 threes this year, and he shot like 38% from them. And he's got a nice looking shooting. Like sometimes when you just see a guy's jump shot, you're like, oh yeah, like that is a consistent jump shot. He's got one of those. I would like him to play the four for Michigan if they were to get him. And then the same guy you mentioned, Alex Terrence, Terrence Shannon would be a really electric wing player to add into the rotation and start right away. And then you could even make Caleb Houston like a shooting guard in that case if he returns and then roll with a pretty lanky lineup. And my last guy, which I've heard we... Those two guys Michigan has reached out to. They have not reached out 
that I've seen to this guy. This guy's name is Desmond Cambridge from Nevada, and this guy is an absolute hooper. And he is someone that I would love as a grad transfer to come in for like a Charles Matthews type role and just be a bucket and play really good defense uh, for Michigan. And then my very last point on the transfer portal is a guy who I do not want, who I saw Michigan has reached out to. Uh, no offense to this kid, but Sam Sesums from Penn State. Mm. I don't really want another Devontae, like because he kind of is like a Devontae Jones a guy. I just don't, I don't want anyone stepping on Frankie Collins' toes at point guard unless they are incredible. Because I want Frankie Collins to run this offense next year as a sophomore. So um, that's why I'm no to Sam Sesums. A six foot ten. OVC player of the year from Murray State just entered the portal, averaged 18 and 9. And, and their sh- point guard, I believe, transferred. Shot 35% from three. What website do you guys 10. use for the transfer portal? I, I just look, look at Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Uh, there's a Twitter my... account called Verbal Commits that tells mm-hmm. you every single guy that enters. Oh, yeah. You're saying that goes into the other one that I did. That's funny. Evan or uh, Alex said that, that Evan Mia guy. Yeah. Uh, he has a really good interface where he lists, like, he ranks who's in the portal. Yeah, um, he has, like, five-star like and four-star rankings for portal guys. And that's your name, Evan, and then M-I-Y-A, Mia. And I like that because that kind of just shows you, like, who the big guys are in the portal. And then if my schools reach out to them, I just type in Michigan portal in the Twitter search bar and then just, like, show up our latest and see, like, has anyone said they've reached out? Jake Weingarten tweets a lot about who reaches out to who also. So those are the guys. Um, but like I said, it's kind of tough when you're just projecting what could happen as opposed to reacting. They just Michigan just needs some more shooting because this team got did in when they just could not make three pointers at times this year. So that is a huge thing. And if if Terrence Williams has to start next year because we don't get some guys, so be it. But I would like him and Kobe Bufkin to be like the six and seven off the bench. I think that would make Michigan the best version of themselves next year if those two guys aren't necessarily starters, but they're coming off the bench to provide a spark of defense and some offense. But I'm excited. There's a lot of moving parts. There... I also can't forget about I can't forget about Jet Howard because he's I think he's going to be a good wing player for Michigan. Uh, coming in, but I they just need depth, like Evan alluded to. Yeah, ro- both rosters for both schools are going to be different in probably a week. So, Evan, Evan, you get you wake up one morning a week from now and you get the text from the five one seven crew that Hunter Dickinson is returning for his third year of basketball. What's your reaction? I am going to laugh, um, but I'm going to say, "Oh crap! I have to deal with this guy for another whole freaking year." Um, I'll probably also yeah. say some other things that can't be repeated on this podcast, but just I'll be upset as a Michigan stand, Michigan State fan, but I'll understand it. And he's just a, he's just a very good college basketball player. Somebody you yeah, hate I to hope play it against. Leaves. Dude, I was thinking, and I was also thinking to myself, I wouldn't go as far to say as like I'd want him to leave, but there is a part where like I don't enjoy the whole offense cosmetically running through the post. Like it's kind of fun to spread things out. I think obviously the best hybrid mix was last year, the elite eight team where you had dominant wing players as well. Like that's an ideal situation this year. More at times they just were like, all right, like every single play is going to go into him. And then you're just going to have to crawl back to win this game. So there's good and bad. Um, If it's cool with you guys, I think, Talked a lot of basketball, and we did the life advice. I, in the beginning, a little bit about the questions. I say we can just pocket these life cues for another round when we build up some more. Because we didn't have a ton of submissions. The main ones were just about the uh, the Oscar stuff. So I think that will close out this week's show. College basketball season has came and went. Looking ahead on the calendar, we will be getting into the draft. That's coming up this month. And then yeah. we will do a Tiger season preview segment at some point where we give our predictions for that and talk Playoffs. about storylines we're looking for at that. <laughs> um, I think those are the main two, and then we'll have other weekly stuff. Oh, we'll close out with our final four picks. Um, pick There's three games left, right? So just bop, bop, bop. Who's winning them and who's winning it all? Uh, I'm going to stick with my bracket. Duke, Kansas, Kansas. That's your bracket right now. Well, my bracket's Kansas winning, so I'm going to have to pick them here too. Got it. I'm going to ride or die with my one team I've been cheering for the last weekend. Um, I'm going to pick North Carolina Villanova. I'm going to pick Villanova. 
Ooh, a rematch. Wow. A rematch. Yeah. Villanova got... lost their more, right? Yeah, Torn yeah. Achilles, sad day. Oh, that is rough. Yeah. Bright side for him. Uh, his girlfriend, they showed, is playing in this NC State UConn game right now. Good for her. On the on the Lady Wolf Pack. Nice. I got North Carolina, Kansas, the Roy Williams Bowl. Mm. Uh, and then, you know what? Ooh. You can't pick Kansas because I did. So. I'll, go, I'll go North Carolina. Wow. That'd be Feels weird. weird to say, but an eight seed. Kind of, isn't that what UConn did that one year with Kevin yeah. Ali? Uh, yeah. Eight or seven. Yeah, that feels right. Feels weird, but feels right. You guys just, are you picking against Duke because you don't want them to win? Mm. Picking against Duke? Because you don't want them to win? 100% correct. I don't want them to win. That's why you picked against them. Partially, I just think this like North Carolina team is just more like dogs. Like there's more dog in them than Duke. And it's... there is the revenge card there, but I feel like Duke might just shrivel under the bright lights again. It is 60-40 of me hatred, like why I'm picking North Carolina, but also North Carolina's, you could argue, like the hottest team in college basketball right now. Um, they've played quality teams, probably better teams down the stretch. They knocked out two Final Four teams already from last year. Yeah. So They're just ripping through people. We'll see. And like their game, their game that, that would have knocked them out was that UCLA game. And then they have a guy like Caleb Love just says, get on my back. And Duke has that and Jeremy Roach. So that's going to be an unbelievable guard matchup there towards is. the end of that game. There's that word again. <sighs> it's going to be a exhilarating <laughs> guard it's matchup. Be excitement. It's going to be a riveting. Must watch TV. I heard a really funny thing on part of my take today that uh, Jim Nance is going to give us tie to uh, Coach K if Duke wins it all instead of a senior because there's no like senior players on that team. And that's just disgusting to think about. Here you go, Coach K. Here's my tie. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. That is our show. Um, shot of MS everywhere. Follow us and get hyped for the draft. People love draft con- content. That's one thing I that love you can just the draft. We love draft We are content. draft NFL we'll analysts. Doing, we are we'll unbiased gonna, NFL analysts. It's, it's that time of year for me to start getting in the weeds so we can actually – get through like four, four rounds of a mock draft for the Lions where I actually know names of, of people. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's a grind. I'm good on the first round, I think, now. But, but Really? Going to take some digging for the rest. I probably, and I'll, I'll have probably I'll finally, two rounds. I'll, I will have my quarterback power rankings coming up here at some Ugh. point, you know, when we get to that. I'm going to... No need. We're not see. drafting one. <laughs> all right. Uh, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, all the good stuff. Um, cheers. Cheers. To episode 65. Cheers. Cheers. And cheers to... I'm going to watch some Frozen 4 hockey for the Wolverines. I'm going to try to watch some of that, so I'm excited for that. Cheers to Captain America with the hat trick last night. We're one game away from making the World Cup. Christian Pulisic. Oh, Pulisic. Uh, I was seeing hockey. Cheers to the Red Wings clinching? giving up 11 goals. The first NHL team oh, to do since 2003. Ooh. Positive right, all in Needed, needed to on, be man. mentioned. Come on. What was that? What was that? Come on. Stat since 2003. What? That's the most goals that have give, been given up in a game since 2003. By the Red Wings? By anybody. No, come on. By anybody. Who was, who was in goalie that night? Probably two, at least two guys. I'm sure someone got We've hold. given up double-digit goals twice driver. this season. We actually, we actually didn't suit up a goalie that game. That's why they scored 11 goals. <laughs> We just had the practice yeah. right. in front of it, and they just had to shoot in the corners and one in the middle. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Show 65. Wrap. Also, Gabe Brown just officially declared. Oh, you did it breaking news. <laughs> <laughs>